Welcome. Uh, joining us today is Dr. Anupam Singh uh, to have a brief discussion on how our medical system is coping up with coronavirus. Uh, Dr. Singh, firstly, thank you so much for being here in the middle of this pandemic. You are taking our time for us. Thank you. Thank and um, quickly jumping on to uh, you know, a few things that we wanted to discuss. Um, you have been dealing with COVID-19 patients directly on a daily basis. So, you know, from your perspective, do you think testing and testing alone is a solution? Or, you know, do you think, you know, what do you think should accompany testing? Okay. Firstly, let's talk about, you know, the, what are the tests available? I mean, and, and how the strategy is evolving, right? So, we have two tests right now. One is the RT-PCR test, which is a throat swab test, right? And other is a blood test. That is called rapid antibody test. The throat swab test. Now, this uh, generally you must understand the natural history of the, how this COVID disease evolves. For first, patient is asymptomatic since acquiring patient is asymptomatic for some days. After five to seven days, patient starts showing the symptoms. Okay. During this phase, only throat swabs can detect this test. And the throat swab has a, unfortunately, throat, and the throat swab test that detects PCR, also called PCR, this detects the viral load of the patients. And the viral load is highest when the patient is symptomatic. Okay. And then after, after one, two days of a start of symptoms, then, then gradually the viral load starts going down. Okay. So in the first seven days, your throat swab is the only bed because the blood tests don't work, neither the antibodies appear. Unfortunately, the swab test, 30% cases are false negative, right? Both in symptomatic and asymptomatic patients. In blood tests, the antibody, it is, but throat swab requires big machines. Pauline chain reaction, the turnaround time is almost like 24 hours. In at better centers, it is around 12 hours. You have to take swab, you have to take the swab properly. The blood test, which is also called rapid antibody test, that is works, antibodies start appearing after seven days. So obviously it is not useful for early detection, but if the patient is presenting after seven days, say he has fever for seven days and he has presented after that, then it will be useful. Or if the patient had the infection a month back, then you will find the antibody in this test. Now, whatever I'll talk, with, is in the light of these things. Now, when India started testing, initially we were, uh, you know, suspecting, you must know that we were, you know, screening the patients from air travel, right? Whichever patients who came from outside. And they are symptomatic contacts. That is, we are saying that, okay, these patients have come from outside, okay? And if they develop symptoms, uh, Okay, then and we will test them all if they are symptomatic. And their contacts, con what are the contacts? That is their family members who develop symptoms. Why were do we doing that when the symptoms develop? Because as I told you, the viral load is highest near the, when the patient is symptomatic. This was our main strategy till around 22nd, 23rd March. But you know, we might have been missing the asymptomatic contacts because if it was, and if you pick the asymptomatic for first seven days, it were, you know, they were asymptomatic only. So we might be missing them. So what the ICMR did was they modified the strategy. They started also, you know, testing the asymptomatic contacts, uh, which is direct that is the family members or those who are closely interacted and high risk ones that is 60 plus age group at day seven, because day seven is most likely the positivity. In addition to that, since it, it is possible because you know one uh, paper in ICMR said that mm, the screening is not perfect as it has happened in India. Some cases were missed. For example, uh, Kanika Kapoor, the famous, uh, there was a singer. Uh, she was, you know, she couldn't be, she, she was not symptomatic, but she was picked up late. Uh, but, uh, you know, the screening might be not perfect and some people might not be traced. So uh, what happened in the process was uh, we started, you know, uh, another guideline was said that if you have pneumonia, fever, cough, and pneumonia cases, which hospitals admit, you have to test them also. 
So these are the three modifications occur, which happen. Then what happened is people, you know, many hotspots started emerging in India. As in some places where you don't have any travel history, you don't have any contact history, and yet people with pneumonia started appearing. Right. So, so uh, uh, ICMR modified its guideline. They said that you can do blood tests also in these regions randomly, okay, for any fever, cough patients, if they're, because it's a high prevalence zone. Because rapid antibody test, as I told, that the PCR has a false negative rate is higher, almost 30 to 40 percent. While in the blood test, false positive rate is higher. So you, sh you should only do it in the high prevalence regions, high, where the probability is high because there, there is a risk of false positive. So we started doing it in the hot spots. Uh, they have arrived a few days back, so the strategy was this. So in light of this, we are talking about, uh, we, I would like to talk about now the, so this is how the testing strategy has modified, you know, evolved till now. Now, the question is, should testing, testing, testing be the only answer? The answer is no. Now, when you want, now here you want to flatten the curve and then bend the curve, right? This is both. Yeah. How do you crush the curve? You flatten the curve and then you bend it. So how do you flatten the curve? You do it with conventional measures, school closures, lockdowns, and then mask wearing, right? So you flatten the curve. You reduce the social interactions. Then how do you bend the curve? You bend the curve, curve by optimal testing and tra tracing. What do I mean by optimal testing and tracing? I mean, if, you, if the same strategies are adopted in Nagaland, which has one cases, and Mumbai, where almost two to 300 cases are, you know, per day are, you know, incidence, incidence of so many cases, then it is like most likely to be useless, right? So the testing has to have a context to it, right? And that should be situation dependent. So, so the and, uh, uh, testing alone should not do. You have to have an optimal tracing. Say you have the test results have to be fast. Your on-ground machinery, it has to be fast and bring the patients, you know, faster, right? And their contact trace their contacts faster. So this is of paramount importance. And why is that important? Because it was seen in China. What was happening was the maximum patients had the transmission happened in families. So when so you know one aspect is you would want to you know keep the patient at home quarantine. Okay, you don't have you don't appear symptomatic till now. You are positive. You can stay at home, but that is the danger because people are not able to quarantine themselves well. And in a fact, in a, you know, in spite of the patient's best effort you know, it gets transmitted inside the family. And that is what the experience of China show. So, and similarly, there have been cases in Bombay where a doctor family, the young doctor came from UK and his all, entire family was affected despite taking best precautions. And the uh, granddad died. There have been a case in Delhi, apart from uh, where 36 members of a family, they were living close by and they got, you know, infected. They were advised home quarantine. The patient was asymptomatic, but this is such a contagious disease. So yeah. testing, tracing and quarantine. Quarantine is a very important strategy. The central quarantine was, you know, very important strategy in Wuhan that affected, effectively brought the R0 down. So social distancing, lockdown, masks, you know, and, and then you have optimal testing, tracing, quarantines, and then if you have hotspots, then you do universal symptom screens. What I do, what I mean by universal symptom screens, every patient with fever and cough, you have to screen them so that they don't escape the system because in a hotspot, they might be, you know, possibly infective cases. So you see now people have started, there have been a lot of fever clinics established by the government. At some places, the government has also ordered the pharmacies and the private setups to, you know, to note by Google Forms, by inter by Google Forms, whatever patients come to fever and cough, they have to fill on and they have given a Google Form link. So that is also a major mode of surveillance. And say if you can still not trace, if you can still not trace, then you go out there in that area and you test randomly. You go to every household, you ask every patient, 
you ask every household that what are your symptoms that was done in Bhilwada, right? You lock down the area, you contain a area. This is a uh, fight which has been fought on the principles of the war. You have containment zones, you have hot spots. So we effect, in effect bring an urgency and the principles of war to it. Firstly, you start with passive surveillance, then we go on active surveillance, we have the hot spot, we have the containment zones. So you, can, you, could, you cannot have a single strategy which is applicable everywhere and a single slogan won't work, but you have to have a concerted effort of all the Swiss, it's like a Swiss knife, it's not a slat, slice hammer, you have to have everything working in unison. So I agree. Uh, very well said. You know, so you mentioned multiple times about, you know, people easily, very easily catching infections, which is yeah, something we've seen with this disease. So, you know, um, as a first line of defense, you know, uh, health workers are the most vulnerable ones. Yes. You know, as of now, I, you know, given the bottlenecks of our system, I want to know how can our health workers be protected better, you know? What is the availability of uh, personal protective equipment like? Now, uh, now, this is an issue right now. What has happened was when the initial case load was, so you must remember that this is a disease against which we don't have many tools to fight. We are always on defensive, as in we don't have an optimal treatment, we don't have an optimal vaccine. So as I told, we have to protect ourselves from the disease, to protect the families by instituting quarantines. You put them in quarantine rooms, which are very well ventilated. And healthcare workers, hospitals are dense environments. Healthcare workers have multiple multiple interactions. So you have to provide them with optimal person protective equipment. Now, when the case load was low, we were using our supplies from the past. And since the lock, and you must remember that the most masks and etc. Uh, Hubei, the Wuhan was, you know, an important mask manufacturer. In fact, nobody in the world, everybody in the world was importing them from China. The UK imported dollar 20 million worth of personal protective equipment from China. And it was found defective. So it is a crisis. I mean, no one had foreseen it. I mean, people, though, you know, they were anticipating it, but don't, no not foreseeing it on that level. The crucial component is an N95 respirator. It's a special type of respirator. Yes. So that it doesn't let your mask, mask in. Now, in India, that as the load, you know, increases, for example, in Mumbai and in many places, now we have started to feel a crunch of uh, you know, worsening supplies. Though government has been active on the job, but I hear from many places that uh, healthcare workers ha have to do with, you know, inefficient supplies now. Now, this is a very, you know, troublesome thing because one healthcare worker is a very high transmission node. For example, all healthcare workers, policemen, whoever are meeting with multiple pe people and multiple point of contacts they are they should be having adequate pp otherwise they end up spreading that was the experience in wuhan almost 30 percent healthcare workers were infected and the hospital has to uh, in china had to fly in doctors from another province to take care of them and these healthcare workers ended up infecting other people as well that was the case in Bhilwada as well so so PP, how how can you make the PP optimal supplies? One, you make them. Other decontamination strategies. How do we optimally reuse and rationally reuse our PP? There have been strategies produced, you know, suggested by CDC because the US, US is having an even worse crisis than us, right? Uh, so, because the, there the case load is very high, despite being a rich nation, developed nation, it is struggling with the supplies. So, how how they are doing it? They, so, you do you every every five days you reuse the mask, and in between you can decontaminate the mask by hydrogen peroxide or UV light. Now, these strategies were never thought before. Why? Because we never had such crisis before. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, actually, on this on this note, I want to ask, like, I want to add in another thing that you know, lately we've been promoting homemade masks quite a lot. Do you, from a medical experience, do you think they are useful? Uh, no, the homemade masks have not a lot of preventive data, as in yeah aspect to it. As in they won't prevent. If you ask, so now the evidence based medicine, the you know. The guideline is to use a random evidence from a randomized control trial that you give uh, an intervention. Mask is also an intervention to one set of people and you don't give it to one set of people. And are they prevented? Now the evidence-based medicine says no. 
because there is not the data is not very you know strong enough in fact that is the region cdc and even who was not advising their the mass till date and they were criticized for it but we have to understand this is not about prevention alone this is about source control as well let's say an asymptomatic person wears a mask mask and so when he coughs so he won't be able to spread it right so it has a dual function right so first function is for prevention other is for source control this is a very important aspect that people don't realize so it is like an altruistic behavior you are wearing a mask you are doing an altruistic we are not necessarily wearing a mask you can cover your face with a cloth you can wear a face shield face shield is as usual to usable it protects your eyes also there is not solid evidence for what i'm saying i think solid evidence is only on based of randomized controlled trials at least in medicine but it appears logical actually till now we don't have many randomized controlled trials in covid right neither in drugs so but still we are going with the logic ideally we would want the best data right rct randomized controlled trials interventions but unfortunately we don't have one so we are you know using precautionary principle that we are evaluating asymmetric risks and you know, taking decisions in that light yes thank you sir thank you so much for sharing your valuable insights um, we will definitely carry this forward and uh, it is it was a pleasure to have you here with us and um, thank you everybody for watching this video if you have any suggestions or opinions please do comment on the video thank you